Having considered configuration interaction wave functions as a post hartree fock model in the last video, I want to look at two additional approaches that find extensive use in the literature for doing post hartree fock calculations, and those are perturbation theory and coupled cluster theory. So many-body perturbation theory is a general theory, and it says, it, in, in raleigh schrodinger perturbation theory in particular, that if you have a, an operator for which you do not know the exact wave functions, but it is related in some way to a different operator for which you do know the exact wave functions, then you have a systematically improvable approach for determining the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of your operator. And so now let me put that in mathematical language. A is some operator and it's got wave functions, that is eigenfunctions and eigenvalues that I just don't have a good way to get at analytically. I don't know what they are. But there's this other operator, A superscript zero, for which I actually know all of the eigenfunctions. I'll also superscript them with zero. In this particular case, I have a subscript on this because uh, there are potentially many of these eigenfunctions, so this must be the ground state of the particular case. Uh, they have eigenvalues. Actually, this A should be indexed with a zero to indicate that it is the ground state eigenvalue. Uh, and because it's an eigenvalue uh, equation, here appears psi again. And the, the good part for me is that my operator where I don't know the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues is related to this one by some sort of a term that can be thought of as being introduced incrementally slowly in a sense. So there's this lambda which couples a0 to a. That is, when lambda is equal to 0, I've got a0. When lambda is equal to 1, maybe I have my full operator over here. And my goal is to recognize this relationship in such a way that I'm going to be able to express weight functions and eigenfunctions of A, not A superscript zero, but A. So, uh, in first order perturbation theory, A sub zero superscript one, and, and so all of these equations derive from carrying out a Taylor expansion of the uh, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the unknown operator using this relationship. And so first order perturbation theory gives you that the eigenvalue is simply the expectation value of the perturbation over the wave functions you get from the unperturbed operator. So that's pretty easy to do. You would imagine carrying out some sort of a calculation and then you just take those wave functions that you can easily determine, you plug in this thing, whatever it is, whatever the perturbation is that takes you from A0 to A, and just evaluate an expectation value. So that's pretty trivial. And you can get other expressions here. I'm not going to go through all the math in the video. You can find it in the book. Uh, there is a second order correction, which looks like this. There, these are corrections, by the way. I guess I should have emphasized that. So this particular notation is, this is how the energy would change as a result of the perturbation. And this is an improved correction, second order correction, for how it would change as a result of the perturbation. You see by the time you're up to third order, it is starting to look a little bit uglier at this stage. You're running over all possible states, J and K, and here you're running over all possible states. So in order to really do this effectively, you need to know all the excited states of the eigen functions that are eigenfunctions for this operator. All right, well, it's hard to explain all of perturbation theory in one slide, although, as I say, you can go to the book to see more of the math. Uh, you also can expand the wave functions with first to first order to second order and so on, so you're improving wave functions. This was just uh, eigenvalues. These are now eigenfunctions, and these are the appropriate equations to do that. Okay, but really, I, I want to bring this all back to energy. The whole idea here was we're trying to correct hartree fock energies, which do not include electron correlation. And so Muller and Plessett were the first to say, maybe if we take the zeroth order Fock operator, so that is, it is the sum of all the one electron operators. So remember, a, a Fock operator, there's a different one for each electron. Each electron sees the average of all the other electrons. So 
to take that to the correct Hamiltonian, what's the perturbation? And actually, if that sounds very complicated, it, it's not all that complicated. If you think of summing together the eigenvalues of the Fock operator, what are those eigenvalues? They're the molecular orbital energies. So I'm just going to add together all the molecular orbital energies. What's wrong with that? Why isn't that the right way to compute the energy of the molecule? Well, the problem is that the electron in a given molecular orbital, let's say it's molecular orbital 4, sees the electron in molecular orbital 6, assuming 6 is an occupied orbital. So the eigenvalue for MO4, the energy value associated with it, includes the repulsion between electron 4 and electron 6. And now I go to orbital 6. Well, the electron in orbital 6 sees the electron in orbital 4. And so its MO energy reflects that interaction too. So I've just counted that twice when I add together energy from MO4 and energy for MO6. And that's the perturbation, if you like. If I were to take the sum of the Fock operators and subtract the electron repulsion energy, I would have the correct Hamiltonian. I would remove that double counting. Okay, and so this is a way of writing that mathematically. I'm going to take the zeroth order Fock operator. If I evaluate that, I get sum of MOs. And now here's my perturbation. I'm going to get rid of the, uh, the electron repulsion energy. And so this is just noting that in the correct Hamiltonian versus the Hartree Fock, uh, there is a slightly different way to compute that, but let's not worry about that technical detail. Okay, that's just the definition of what F0 means, and I've said it already in words. So, what does that mean? Well, if I think about the first order correction, all that does is it takes me from the zeroth order energy, which double counted the electron repulsion, and now I'll add in, fixing that up, so when I add A0 and A superscript 1, all I do is I get back to Hartree-Fock theory. So I haven't really improved anything yet. But if I look at the second order correction, and I actually take all these wave functions that I could possibly generate, so these are like CI wave functions, right? I'm, gonna, I'm considering excited states if you go back and look at the formulas. But the operator I'm plugging inside is the Hamiltonian, op sorry, the, the uh, electron repulsion operator. And so it turns out all that survives are a series of two electron integrals. And I've indexed them here by occupied and virtual orbitals running over I, J, A, B. These are the MO energies of those orbitals. So I get a second order correction, which only requires me to compute two electron integrals. So that's not so hard to do and to know MO energies from Hartree-Fock theory. And that's not so hard to do either. So eigenvalues are already available. I got to calculate the electron repulsion integrals over MOs. That's uh, you know, not so bad. I already did it over basis functions. What the heck? It scales reasonably nicely. It turns out it scales as n to the fifth, where n is the size of the uh, basis set. Remember, Hartree-Fock theory was n to the fourth. A nice feature is that it is size extensive so this business of if I have two hydrogen molecules infinitely separated, is the energy equal to twice a single hydrogen molecule? The answer is yes. And finally, higher orders of perturbation theory, third order, fourth order, fifth order, they're well defined, but a drawback of perturbation theory is you're never guaranteed you'll actually converge. You can have perturbation series that uh, oscillate indefinitely. You can have perturbation series that actually diverge. That's even worse. But in most instances, uh, one tends to capture electron correlation in a useful way by uh, using perturbation theory. So uh, this just repeats what I said. Uh, we've got perturbation theory mapping an inexact operator to an exact operator. It was Moeller and Plessett who first figured out how to make that operator the Hamiltonian. But uh, it is worth noting that perturbation theory is usually invoked when you have a small perturbation. That's when the Taylor expansion ought to work best. Remember though that we're actually making the perturbation the entire electron repulsion energy. That's a huge number. So in a sense when it was first proposed many people thought it was kind of a goofy idea. The fact that in practice it works is testament to the power of perturbation theory I suppose. 
So MP0, that's the zeroth order operator, that has the double counting. MP1 just gets you back to Hartree-Fock theory. And MP2 then captures some good, I have good in quotes, a, a sort of an acceptable amount of correlation energy, it's better than none at all. And higher orders are available. You can get up to about MP6 in modern codes, but it starts to scale at a uh, high level, and we'll see that more in a moment. You can also do perturbation theory on top of multi-reference models. So in the last video I talked about MCSCF and CAS SCF. So if you do second order perturbation theory on a CAS SCF wave function, that's called CAS PT2. If you do it on a RAS SCF wave function, it's called RAS PT2. And there are uh, other analogs. And the thing to bear in mind, though, is that you're not guaranteed to see convergent behavior, and you can run into pathological cases. I, I say here unpleasant frequency, but in truth, it's, it's really not that often. Unpleasant, of course, is whenever it actually hits you as opposed to somebody else. I want to talk about one other uh, method before wrapping up this video, and that is coupled cluster theory. And so remember that in configuration interaction, we envision an improved wave function as a linear combination of Slater determinants starting from the Hartree-Fock determinant and then including singly excited determinants, doubly excited determinants, and so on. And so coupled cluster theory starts by saying, you know, electrons usually interact in pairs, right? There's one electron that interacts uh, with another electron in its own orbital and Really, it's the paired electrons interacting with one another. That's where electron correlation has the largest effect. So even though many electron interactions will also be important, it's going to tend to be because of related pair interactions, which are called disconnected clusters. And if you want to think about decomposing those energetics in that way, you can use a so-called exponential ansatz, which will perhaps capture the important parts of the correlation energy faster for you. So I think that's the best way to see that is just to think about uh, the mathematics of how we actually write that down. So let me define an operator. So the T2 operator, a T is an excitation operator. The subscript 2 means that it does double excitations. And so if you like, T2 operating on a Hartree-Fock wave function generates some linear combination of doubly excited, uh, it, it actually generates a doubly excited uh, determinant. And these coefficients may appear in subsequent equations in order to decide how much weight should be given to this determinant. So the full CI wave function for n electrons, full CI, remember, considers every possible excitation could actually be written as 1 plus t if you want to generate the full CI wave function 1 plus t so that means you'll have a 1 plus t1 plus t2 plus t3 so I'm expanding t here as being single excitations they're right here double excitations they're right here and you go up to as many electrons as you have n okay so this operating on the Hartree-Fock reference defines full CI 1 plus t1 plus t2 blah 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 coupled cluster says I'd like to define a different way to generate wave functions. And in particular, I'm not going to operate with t. I'm going to operate with e to the t. So you can ask yourself, what the heck does that mean? How do you take an exponential to an operator power? And really, it's, it's just defined by a power series expansion of e. So for the moment, let me just look at t2. Forget about the entire t. I just want to think about t2. So what I mean when I say operate by e to the t2 on the Hartree-Fock wave function, and that's called coupled cluster doubles, because I'm doing doubles, well, I should expand the exponential. So I'll get 1 plus t2 plus t squared, t, t2 squared, that is, over 2 factorial, plus t2 cubed over 3 factorial, blah, 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 times operating on the Hartree-Fock wave function. And repeated applications of t2, which is what's implied by t2 squared here, I'll do a t2 and then a subsequent t2, that generates these disconnected clusters of double excitations that uh, means you will be accounting for pair interactions more efficiently than just generic interactions. So just as in uh, configuration calculations, and I didn't talk about this in detail, uh, you can actually solve for the low energy eigenvalues 
that is the ground state, for example, through an iterative approach that uh, is more efficient than doing a full diagonalization of a matrix. But when you do that with coupled cluster, you get a, a series of coupled equations, and I won't go through all the math here. I think it's a, a little bit uh, technically detailed. Suffice it to say that by considering certain kinds of integrals with the operator acting on the Hartree-Fock wave function and the Hamiltonian inserted, you end up with a means to determine these t values. So these are what you need in order to write the coupled cluster uh, equation. And you see that here's the correlation energy. It depends on these t values. How do you get the t values? Well, it depends on these integrals, which depend on the correlation energy. So there is a self-consistent approach in order to solve these systems of coupled equations and end up with coupled cluster wave functions. And if that seems a little opaque, well, the math is actually extraordinarily complex, and you shouldn't feel badly about that. But suffice it to say that it's a means to construct a combination of excited determinants, much like CI, but designed to capture more correlation more quickly. Uh, and so uh, I've already emphasized that. The math is somewhat tedious. You can show that coupled cluster is size extensive for any level of excitation. So that's better than CI. Remember that CI was only size extensive for full CI. So that's a reason to prefer coupled cluster to CI. You can, again, uh, truncate in your uh, decision of which excitations to include. So CCSD is single and double excitations. The math I showed was for just CCD, only doubles, but singles are not terribly expensive. Uh, you can add triples, CCSDT. It becomes extremely expensive if you do that. You can estimate the triples using perturbation theory. And it turns out that when you do that, you construct a model. It's called CCSD parenthesis T. And that model is so successful, there's a little bit of canceling error, it turns out, in uh, using perturbation theory for the triples that actually captures some of the quadruple-like effects. And so it's a you know, sort of amazingly successful uh, stroke there. And so you'll see these kinds of calculations a lot for wave function theory, so much so that uh, CCSDT is sometimes called the gold standard of single reference wave function theory. Single reference meaning I start from a Hartree-Fock wave function as opposed to a multi-configuration self-consistent field, an MCSCF wave function. So I want to wrap up uh, this portion of uh, this video by talking a bit about price. So computer time is money, and so we'd like to know about price and performance. And so here is in order the relative cost from a computer time perspective of doing some of these post hartree fock calculations. So hartree fock is the, where all of them start, so you do a hartree fock calculation. MP2 and MP3 and CCD, and actually I'm sorry, these less than symbols are sort of an indication of quality. So better quality from these three levels of theory. Going to CISD gives you slightly better quality again. Going to MP4, neglecting, so this is fourth order perturbation theory, but neglecting triple excitations. Uh, there's also something called quadratic CI with singles and doubles, and here's coupled cluster with singles and doubles. Those all give sort of a similar level of accuracy. MP4 can be better than that. And then finally, here's this gold standard I mentioned, and here's quadratically, uh, qu sorry, quadratic CI. So what is this quadratic CI? I didn't actually present it in detail. It's a way to adjust CI to bring back the size extensivity. But in practice, hardcore theorists will call QCI broken coupled cluster in some sense. It's missing a few things that are present in coupled cluster, and it costs just as much. So usually people won't use this much anymore, but coupled cluster is, is to be preferred. So if this is quality, what about price? So here's the scaling behavior. Hartree-Fock goes as n to the fourth. MP2 goes as n to the fifth, where n is the number of basis functions. All of these models go as n to the 6th. All of these models go as n to the 7th. So, you know, this is a number that gets really big fast, right? Uh, if you double the size of your basis set, your calculation will become 2 to the 7th power times more expensive. I'll, I'll let you plug that into your calculator and see exactly what number is 2 to the 7th. And so on and so on. As you add full triples, now you're up to n to the 8th. Full triples in, in couple cluster theory. So in some sense, if you want to ask, you know, what's, what's a good calculation to do, well, MP2 is a pretty good deal because you get 
a decent amount of electron correlation, and really you're at kind of a minimal increase in scaling behavior of the calculation. And if you're going to go another step up, if you look inside the end of the sixth scaling models, actually a MP4 with uh, uh, singles, doubles, and quadruples is pretty decent. A couple clusters in there as well, and it's a perfectly reasonable model. And finally, if you're willing to bite the bullet and go to end of the seventh, that's going to be this gold standard coupled cluster singles, doubles, and triples. So I'm going to end there, having discussed the, the quality of these different post tartary fock levels. And in the next video, we're going to actually look more carefully at benchmarking. And we're going to come back, finally, leave the equations, which I'm sure some of you have found a little bit painful, and come back to thinking about molecules and uh, the things that chemists would care about.